Let us bless the Lord, singing Psalm 34, verses 1 through 10. The first 10 verses of Psalm 34. Gracious Father in heaven, we lift up our voices and hearts to thee with the great name of Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of God, the Lord of both the dead and the living, ruling over heaven and hell and this creation, because we know that he is thy beloved Son, that he is the mediator of the covenant, the intercessor for the church and the one who laid down his life for the sheep and even father reminding ourselves in thy presence of his glory our faith is quickened our prayers are strengthened even subjectively in our own hearts because we know that we have a standing with thee that thou art the god who hears us in christ that thou art the god who is graciously inclined towards us who views us favorably because of his intercession atoning death on the cross and lord god we cast ourselves before thee not only in worship but also confessing our frailties our weaknesses our sins our failures because lord god there is no good in us 
apart from what was put there by thy sovereign grace, wrought in us by the Holy Spirit, so that we, even at the best of times, and even not knowing our sins as we ought, confess freely that we are unprofitable servants. Servants, though, though not very profitable. We pray, Lord God, that thou would graciously forgive our sins, that thou would put us back upon our feet, as it were, when we fall, and that thou, Lord God, would equip us with courage and confidence, that thou would grant us a steadfast, unwavering, unshakable faith, so that we, as the righteous, are as bold as a lion, clinging to the truth as good witnesses. We pray, Lord God, that thou would give strength to those whose hands hang down, whose knees are weak, those who have in the battle of the faith been wounded grievously and so laid low. We pray, Lord God, that thou would grant to us faith in the promises because through faith we are enabled to fight with the sword of faith and we are quickened. We begin to see again the destination to which we're headed as pilgrims. And when we are laid low and hit with mighty blows like Jeremiah beholding the desolations of Jerusalem after that city fell to the Babylonians, we may remind ourselves, call to mind the great truth that great is thy faithfulness, that thy mercies they fail not, that they are new every morning, and that he, that we like him may then say, therefore we have hope. We ask, Lord God, that thou would cleanse us of all the filth of this world, and probably even worse, the filth that is naturally inside us, that we may be clean, that we may have a clean conscience, that we may therefore work the works of thee, our Father, not to earn or to make ourselves better in thy sight or to use it as an excuse or cover up or as a substitute, atoning for our own sins as we often foolishly think, but that being heartened by the good news of the gospel, we may have consolation. We pray, Lord God, that this confidence in Jesus Christ may equip us to bring up our children consciously in thy fear, that thou, Lord God, would help us to use our authority rightly, according to the word and out of love, not as tyrants, oppressing and afflicting our children, making them angry or bitter, but not either as cowards who neglect the office, position, standing we have in Christ, and just let our children go on in their sinful ways because we can't be bothered, because we don't really care about their iniquities. We ask, Lord God, that thou would give us wisdom to deal with their sins as well as our own. Wisdom, too, to correct and guide them. And grant us, Lord God, deep humility as we pray over them in their waywardness. Understanding, Father, too, how wayward we are, how we as thy children err, how thou art the God who even gives us erring or angry or bitter children to teach us about our own sins so that we focus on our own ways and turn them back to thee by thy grace. We ask, Lord God, that thou would grant strength to our office bearers and good hope through believing. Give them the confidence of their office and we pray, Lord God, that thou would provide for us here in this place elders, deacons, and a minister for the years and decades to come until the Lord returns. We ask, Father, for thy blessing as we look at eschatology and the end times in our classes on Wednesday night, that thou would fortify us too through a deeper understanding of the glory and joy of faith in our classes on Tuesdays, and we pray, Lord God, for our children as they learn the truth of catechism, that these things may be their joy and comfort, that these things may stick fast to them, that they may enjoy the truth 
that despite the work there often is, help them in that, we pray, that they may realize the joy of their salvation, that they may see the benefit and blessedness of the truth as it is in Jesus. And we ask that our children too study hard and equip themselves at school and in all their education so that they may honestly give themselves to their work as we as adults do to ours to please not merely our teachers or our employers but to please Jesus Christ in the high calling we have as prophets, priests and kings as those who live before thy face and we ask Lord God that thou make us good witnesses bring us good contacts to various people people who are outside of Jesus Christ and who are becoming sensible of the utter futility of human life, of the pointlessness of existing without Jesus Christ, of the awfulness of facing a future which is so little to offer, and of death, the final blow which brings an end to even the miseries and what little joys they have in their earthly existence. Grant, Lord God, that our paths may cross with people like this uh, who, who want to know about the truth of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins, because thou art working in their lives to expose sin and misery. We pray, Father, too, for people who go to church who are oppressed by wicked, unfaithful office bearers who realize that unlike, unlike most there, that they're not actually even being taught the word of God. We pray, Lord God, that God put us in touch with people like that who actually want to learn what the scriptures teach and who actually want to live to please thee, their Redeemer. We ask, Father, too, that thou would bless our members who can't be with us this morning in their worship with us as best they can in their homes. For those who join with us in various institutions, we pray, Lord God, for those who tune in from different countries, from friends and brethren in far-flung lands or even in various parts of the British Isles. Care for thy church in Germany, in Hungary, all around Europe and in the Americas and in the far-flung parts of this globe. Build up that kingdom. Fit more and more of the living stones into the great temple indwelt by Jesus Christ Send, Lord God, the signs of his coming and send, Lord God, him, our Savior, to come again and to make all things new. Grant us spiritual strength and clarity of mind and a united heart to worship thee in this service, to call upon thy name, to concentrate on what we sing and what we hear so that with uplifted hearts we may worship thee and give thanks for a great salvation. And even so, Lord, answer our petitions in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. The 44th Psalm, we'll sing verses 16 through 26 where the church confesses her afflictions at the hands of the avenging foe, foe and yet confesses too that the Lord has not cast us off or forgotten us. Rise and help, Lord, we ask. That's Psalm 44, 16 to the end.
Let us read together Galatians 3, verses 1 through 18. Galatians 3, 1 through 18. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you in the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful or believing Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse of for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law by being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, Yet, if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Amen. Let's sing Psalm 33, verses 10 through 17. 10 through 17 of Psalm 33. <coughs>
worship the Lord as we give our offerings. Let us reread our text, Galatians 3, verse 15, and 17 and 18. We'll deal with verse 16 separately, Lord willing, this evening. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. This I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, 
it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. The Apostle Paul is deeply troubled because the false gospel of justification by faith and works was making inroads into the churches of Galatia. And you can picture him shaking his head as he writes verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? And then you can see him almost holding up one finger and saying, This only would I learn of you. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And then he asks three more rhetorical and convicting questions in the next three verses. And then, beginning with Galatians 3 verse 6, Paul takes us back to Father Abraham in the first book of the Bible, Genesis, because Abraham is the number one biblical figure who exemplifies the truth of justification. And we've been looking at that recently in our sermons from verses 6 through 14. And here are the key words the apostle takes from the Abrahamic narrative in Genesis 11 or 12, the call of Abraham, all the way to his death in Genesis 25. Believe or faith. Righteousness, imputed righteousness, or justification, God declaring someone righteous. The children of Abraham or the sons of Abraham. The nations or the Gentiles or the heathen. Blessing, promise. And if you read those 12 or 13 chapters, these are the key theological words that keep popping up and that Paul draws upon to teach the truth of justification. And then in contrast to that, Paul mentions law, which requires works, which call forth God's curse. And there are these two ways, as a common with Abraham, believing, righteousness, justification, the children of Abraham, the blessing, the promise. And on the other hand, law, works, and curse. And all of this leads us to the cross where there is redemption from the curse of the law through our Savior's substitutionary sufferings because justification is in Christ alone, not in the law, and by faith alone, not by works. Now in our texts, this Lord's Day, Paul takes more gospel weapons out of his Abrahamic theological arsenal. He takes the word promise, singular, or promises from the Abrahamic narrative, and then he mentions the word covenant for the first time because there was a covenant with Abraham. And then he says there's this issue of the seed in Genesis. We'll deal with that tonight. And then there was the inheritance, because that's another big theme. And those are in Genesis 3, 15 through 16. And just as with these first century Judaizers in Galatia, whom Paul is here opposing, these are also the key concepts in setting forth the gospel truth of justification by faith alone today. I mean, if you're going to go into pig farming key issue is the supply of food for your pigs. Where are you going to keep them? The price of pork, getting staff. I mean, these are the basic things you work with if you're a pig farmer. Well, if you're dealing with justification by faith alone, these are the things you work with. Whether you're going to teach the truth about all these concepts and putting them together, or whether you're going to corrupt them through false doctrine. And these are the issues if you're 
talking about justification with someone out of Judaism or even Islam, with someone within Roman Catholicism or evangelicals and Catholics together, if we're dealing with the new perspectives in Paul or the federal vision or liberal Protestantism, if you're witnessing to someone who's trapped in a cult or in secularism, it all comes back to this forgiveness with God, righteousness in his sight, Father Abraham, the covenant with Abraham, believing, righteousness, not the law, not works. That's the only, that's only the way of the curse. And besides all that, beloved, and most immediately pressing for us is our own peace of conscience. Because when your sins rise up against you, and when your guilt threatens to overwhelm you, you've got to go back to the gospel truth exemplified supremely in Father Abraham, who, like all true children of God, was justified or declared righteous by faith alone. You go back to the basics, although the basics aren't to be despised for all that. It's the heart of the whole thing. You look to Jesus Christ, who is the seed of Abraham, as we'll hear tonight. You embrace the promise given to Abraham. You receive the blessing of Abraham. And you receive the inheritance of Abraham. And you do that as a child of Abraham and as a beneficiary of the covenant with Abraham. Genesis 11 through 12, 11 or 12 to Genesis 25, isn't just here was this guy from Abraham, he came from Ur of the Chaldees. His life is the exemplar of one who's justified by faith and who lives out of faith for the church of all ages, whether Jew or Gentile. Tonight, we're going to, this morning, we're going to see that the Abrahamic covenant... The Abrahamic covenant is not annulled or made void because that, in effect, is what the Judaizers did and what every teacher of the false gospel does, annulling the Abrahamic covenant. And we're going to see that the Abrahamic covenant is not annulled and it could not be annulled because, number one, think of its divine author. Think, number two, of its historic precedence. That's especially verse 17. And think of its gracious character. That's verse 18. The Abrahamic covenant is not annulled. Its divine author, its historic precedence over the law of Moses, and its gracious character. Now our text opens with an illustration taken from principles that are generally admitted between men. The apostle does this at various places in his letters. He appeals to principles that are generally admitted between men. Verse 15. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. If I talked in the street about this or my next door neighbor, everybody would say, sure, we all know that. Yeah, it's basic. And here it is. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed... No man disannulleth or addeth thereto. And to that, everybody would say, well, yeah, I get that. The subject in this verse is a covenant. A man's covenant. A human covenant. Whether this human covenant concerns property, or some business dealings, or an inheritance, or international affairs, or whatever. We're dealing with a human covenant. And secondly, we're dealing with a human covenant that is confirmed. It's ratified, it's declared valid, it is sanctioned and settled. Now there are various ways that a covenant could be confirmed among human beings. Maybe it's a handshake. We've made a covenant, put it there. Or it's an oath. I swear that I will do such and such. Or it's a matter of a signature. Put it on the contract. Or maybe even, especially in old days or in a really formal situation, there's a seal that is put upon the document. 
Maybe the covenant is ratified by a public acclamation or even royal assent. But whatever it is, this human covenant has been confirmed and settled. And verse 15, explaining what everyone understands, but I'm drawing out the components so we all get it. So confirmed, this human covenant is set in stone, settled and binding. Brethren, I speak after the manner of man, appealing to general human principles that everybody would agree with. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now, I know some of you, with certain types of mindsets, you may be thinking, well, but there's exceptions to the general rule. What about in extreme cases? What if all the parties involved agree to a change? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we're dealing here with the basic, simple, uncomplicated scenario without having to get into all the clauses and exceptions and then the apostle would have to rip another letter and almost a legal document. And this human covenant in our scenario has been confirmed. And the point is, it can't be voided or annulled and it can't be added to with a little codicil coming after it, as verse 15 says. And, though it doesn't specifically say this, it can't actually be subtracted from either. And I have a pretty good idea why it doesn't mention it can't be subtracted from, but be that as it may. Verse 15, I'm using a human analogy, the apostle says, even if it's a man's covenant, if it be confirmed or ratified, nobody can disannul it or add to it. And everyone should have gotten that. And everyone needs to have gotten that because that's the groundwork. And the apostle is going to draw forth an analogy with it, to it, in verses 17 and 18. And the first general point he makes is... How much more so cannot the divine covenant, and he's referring especially to the divine covenant with Abraham, how much more so cannot the divine covenant with Abraham be voided or added to or subtracted from? Because we're dealing here with the covenant with Abraham, with Jehovah and not some man, He's the one who made this covenant with Abraham and he is the one who confirmed the covenant with Abraham and he also maintains it and perfects it. And if you say, well, how did God confirm the covenant with Abraham? Well, there are some who claim that the covenant with Abraham was confirmed by the sign and seal of circumcision, dealt with especially in Genesis 17, and which is explained as a sign and a seal in Romans 4, verse 11. Circumcision confirmed. Others say it was especially the sacrifices that confirmed the covenant. And here we think of the sacrifices in Genesis 15, for example. Others with appeal to Genesis 22 and Hebrews 6 verse 17, say it was an oath. God swore an oath. So he made a promise and then he added to this an oath to confirm it, this covenant with Abraham. And there, there are yet others who say we're not to nail it down to one specific thing that confirmed the Abrahamic covenant, but we're to think of it more generally. God confirmed the covenant with Abraham in that he didn't, as it were, merely think about it or even jot it down as a private note to himself about it and then leave it at that. But rather, God confirmed the, problem, the, the, the covenant with Abraham and not only thinking about it, timelessly, of course, as the all-knowing and wise God, but as also promulgating it to Abraham, declaring it to his servant. And he did that on many occasions 
in Genesis 12 and 13 and 15 and 17 and 18 and 21 and 22. So he's confirming, he keeps on repeating this covenant. And you could throw in, he reinforced it with the oath, especially in Genesis 22, and with sacrifices, as in Genesis 15. And he signified and sealed it by circumcision in Genesis 17. So though it's a man's covenant, if it's confirmed, nobody can disannul it or add to it. If that's the way it is with a man's covenant, how much more so with a divine covenant, verse 17 is arguing, because God himself made and confirmed his covenant with Abraham in many different ways and many times. And Paul's general point is that it's an absolute disgrace that though all mankind recognizes that basic human contracts once ratified and confirmed, can't be annulled or changed. Or you can add to them or subtract them. Yet the Judaizers and everyone who follows them, and indeed all false gospelers who bring in works as the basis or means of justification, they actually reckon that the divine covenant with Abraham, the divine covenant, can be annulled. John, the Apostle John, makes a similar argument in 1 John 5 regarding you know, believing man as opposed to believing God. 1 John 5 verse 9, If we receive the witness of men, and we typically do when they tell us, you know, I've got some post for you that the postman delivered when you weren't in, or... Oh, you better check around the back because I think your dog kennel's got a leak in the roof. You know, you, you generally think that they're credible. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. What he tells us in his word. For this is the witness of God which he hath testified of, of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself, but he that believeth not God hath made him a liar. Because... He believeth not the record that God gave of his son. That is, usually you believe what most human beings tell you, but you don't even believe what God says, and you're calling him a liar. And here Paul makes a similar argument. Man, he usually keeps his covenant, and it's confirmed, and you can't disannul it. But you guys, you're disannulling God's covenant with Abraham. God, he's arguing here, the apostle, and indeed John, from the lesser to the greater. If a covenant with, that man makes can't be disannulled, how much more a covenant which God makes, this covenant with Abraham? And here we should compare the nature of fallen man to the nature of the living God as regards their making and confirming covenants. Consider a man who makes a covenant. Now, he may not even in himself be wise. He may be a fool. He may not be wise in making a covenant with this person regarding these things and at this time. And when he comes to actually frame the covenant stipulations, you'd say to yourself, you know, this is very foolish. This is going to get this guy into trouble. But here God is making a covenant and he's the only wise God. And so there's no lack of wisdom in our heavenly Father. Now a man may make a covenant and then regret making this covenant because of unforeseen and perhaps even unforeseeable circumstances and he gets himself in a real mess. And that's why you need to be very careful if you're making covenants or agreements or contracts that are that are binding. But we're dealing here with God making and confirming a covenant, the one who perfectly knows the future because he eternally decrees the future. And so he can never be caught out by any future event or action. 
And if even a human covenant, generally speaking, you can't disannul it, well, so much more the divine covenant, particularly because he is wise and the God who disposes of all things. Now, a man make a, may make a covenant and everything looks okay, but then later on he loses his health or his wealth. He loses his interest in the project or his influence. And now he's caught with a covenant that he's just saddled with. But of course, if God's making a covenant, he can never lose anything because he's all-powerful and infinitely rich. Now, sadly, too, a man may make a covenant and then change his mind or prove faithless and try desperately to get out of it. But with God, none of that obtains either because he is always faithful and true and he is the one who changeth not. And so here we have the analogy, the comparison. Here's this human illustration that everyone will get, verse 15. Even if it's a man's covenant, if it's confirmed, no man can disannul it or add to it. And this I say, verse 17, regarding God's covenant. And this I say that the covenant, the covenant here with Abraham, the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of Abraham of none effect. And the apostle is stressing this because this is not only opposing the false gospel, but this is simple, basic good news to us regarding this covenant with Abraham specifically and the covenant of grace of which it is a manifestation, the covenant of grace more generally. In that covenant, we have full salvation in Jesus Christ by the shedding of his blood that reconciles us to God. And this passage is saying it cannot be disannulled. That's the case with men's covenants in general, though we don't want to talk about the exceptions. And it's even more the case with God's covenant. It can't be disannulled. Satan can't cancel it. Your own sins, wicked as they are, cannot overthrow it. Now notice I'm not saying sin willy-nilly. I'm saying the exact opposite. But if you're a true believer... Don't despair, you're outside the covenant. No, repent. The sins of believers don't destroy the covenant. It can't be disannulled. Because God has promised that he will perform the mercy promised to our fathers because he forever remembers and keeps his covenant. It is unannullable. Let's go further, because the apostle does. With a human covenant, the easiest time to get out of it, if you can get out of it, but the easiest time to get out of it is as soon as possible after it's made. Now, some of you may have read the back of the bulletin already. Don't despair if you haven't. It's a meditation on Proverbs 6. Verses 1 through 5. My son, if you are a surety or guarantee for your friend, you've made a, a covenant so that you are liable to fulfill his debts if he can't pay his bills. If you've done this, Solomon says in all wisdom, then, then you're, you're, you're trapped. What if this guy proves false? What if he wastes his money? And then you're liable. You could end up going into slavery for him. I mean, do you love him that much? Is he worth it? And so he says in verse 3, Do this now, my son. Deliver yourself. 
Go to the hand of your friend, humble yourself, and don't go to bed that night. Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber from your, nor slumber to your eyelids, like a deer from the hand of a hunter, or a bird out of the hand of the fowler. Get out of that ensnaring covenant as quickly as you can. Let me give you a second biblical example which basically says you know if you've got these claims and there's some sort of an agreement and you need to act act quickly i'm referring to jephthah's struggle with the ammonites in judges 11 the ammonites were claiming part of israel's land and jephthah in judges 11 verse 26 makes the obvious point while Israel dwelt in Heshbon and her towns and in Aror and her towns and in all the cities that be along by the coast of Arnon, 300 years, why therefore did ye not recover them within that time? I mean, if, you really, if they really were your cities, you had 300 years and you never contested it, you never brought it up. Now, if they really were your land, that was the time to do it. But you didn't do it. Three centuries have passed. And his point is... They're not really yours, and you know fine well they're not. Now here, in Galatians 3, verse 17, we read, This I say, that the covenant, the covenant with Abraham, that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. So the covenant was confirmed before. That's the language that's used. And then the law, referring to the law of Moses, the law came 430 years after. So here's this covenant with Abraham that God made and God confirmed. And now you Judaizers are trying to add to and so disannul the covenant of Abraham, but the law was only given 430 years after the ratification of the Abrahamic covenant. Now, if God's covenant with Abraham could have been disannulled, you'd need to get in in the first few days or weeks or years. But 430 years after, not a chance. The Abrahamic covenant has, as they say in legal spheres, the Abrahamic covenant has precedence. It has precedence. It has historic precedence. You heard the whole Roe versus Wade thing, and they say this law must be enforced because it's a precedence for some 50 years. So you can't disannul it. Well, here we've got historic precedence of 430 years. And then there's something else here in verse 17. There's a phrase in Christ. This I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul. Now the phrase in Christ means literally into Christ. That is, in English you would say unto Christ. That is, with a view to Christ. So the covenant with Abraham was not only made 430 years after, before the giving of the law, but the covenant with Abraham has a view to Jesus Christ some, let's say, 1,400 years after the giving of the law. So the covenant with Abraham isn't some unimportant thing. It's directly pointing forward to and even fulfilled in the Messiah. It's not an arbitrary thing because there are some covenants, let's say, that aren't that important and are arbitrary and you could change them without really annoying or disrupting things that much but the Abrahamic covenant not only was confirmed by God 430 years before the giving of the law but it looked beyond the law to the son of God himself and his cross the Abrahamic covenant presents Jesus Christ as the object of faith the one in whom we believe. 
The Abrahamic covenant deals with imputed righteousness or justification, God's declaration that we are righteous in Jesus Christ. The Abrahamic covenant teaches the way of blessing in the Messiah. The Abrahamic covenant teaches that not only Jews, but also Gentiles are justified and blessed through believing in the Messiah. In fact, as we'll see tonight, the promises and the inheritance of the Abrahamic covenant are first of all made over to Jesus Christ, not even human beings, first of all made over to Christ. And so the law, that is the Mosaic law, cannot disannul the Abrahamic covenant and cannot make the promise of God of none effect because it came 430 years after and that Abrahamic covenant was even looking beyond the law to the sole purpose of God with the whole universe, the coming of Christ and his cross. Yeah, I see what you mean. You can't this and all that. Yeah, of course you can't. And this brings us to our third and final point. Verse 18 brings in the issue of the inheritance in the Abrahamic covenant. And the inheritance, centrally, it includes various things, but the inheritance, as, various, as even the word itself would suggest, involves land issues. It's the number one thing that people inherit or even want to inherit, but land. And the inheritance is, in its most restrictive <laughs> and basic form, is the land of Canaan. That's what God promised Abraham, the land of Canaan. And then on other occasions, it isn't just the land of Canaan, the bit that was later occupied by the 12 tribes. It's all the way down to the river of Egypt, a wadi that goes partway to, before you get to the river Nile. And at the other side, up to the Euphrates and Tigris, into Syrian territory. And that was ruled over by David in the days of the Davidic Empire, not just a kingdom. So there is the inheritance. And then, when you read the Old Testament, if you read Psalm 2 towards the end, and Psalm 47 and Psalm 72, the Abrahamic covenant for the land is actually implied at the very least wider than that. And when the prophets deal with the universe, deal with the Abrahamic covenant, they actually enlarge it even more and it appears like, and in fact actually is, embracing the whole of the planet. And then when you come over to, Gen to Romans 4, verse 13, it comes right out and says that the promise to Abraham was that he would be the heir of the cosmos. The whole cosmos. And when you read Hebrews 11, it says it's not only the world the whole cosmos, but it's the heavenly city and the heavenly country. And it says, not only that this objectively was what was promised, the inheritance to Abraham, but this was subjectively what Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all his true children always looked for and always understood the land promised to be about. The whole cosmos and as heavenly Ah. Logically, there are two ways of receiving the inheritance of the land. You can receive it by law, by works, that is, you can earn it. Or you could receive it by promise, that is, you believe it, because that's what you do with a promise. Promise deals with, faith deals with promise, and a promise calls forth faith. So you inherit the land by believing not by working. There are works, of course. Christians do work, and we work strenuously. And Paul talked about himself working more abundantly than them all, all the apostles. But they come after faith, and as a result of believing. Here we're dealing with justification, how you inherit by believing. Verse 18 says, If the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. If Abraham or Isaac or Jacob 
or Moses or any of the Israelites inherited on the basis of the law or by the means of the law, then it's no more of promise and it's not of faith. Because law and promise, like works and faith, in this subject are opposing principles. They are two contraries. They are like oil and water. They don't actually mix. And there are other scriptures, I'll quote two, actually both from Romans, that make this point. Romans 4 verse 14 is very similar to Galatians 3 verse 18. It states, If they which are of the law be heirs, that is, inherit, and inherit the land, which the previous verse says is the whole cosmos, if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. Here's another passage in Romans which teaches contraries. Romans 11, verse 6. If it's by grace, then it's no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it is of works, then it's no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. And so Galatians 3 is teaching over against the Judaizers and all who teach justification by smuggling in a little bit of man's works, so-called, that it's faith alone in the promise of God in Jesus Christ by which we receive righteousness, by which we receive God's blessing, and by which we receive the inheritance. It's all a package. Righteousness, the blessing of God, and the inheritance all come only through believing in Jesus Christ. And that is actually what the Abrahamic covenant teaches. Not what the rabbis say, not what Islam says, not what the Church of Rome says, nor what the Federal Vision says, but this is what Galatians 3 says. God's covenant with Abraham and its promise and inheritance, <coughs> you don't add to it law. You don't say you get it by law and gospel. No, you don't get it by law and gospel. You don't get it by law. You don't get it by works. You don't add works to faith. It's only by believing the gospel promise. Because if you do that, you are actually annulling the Abrahamic covenant, totally disagreeing with the heart and soul of Genesis 12 through 25, which after the universal aspect of Genesis 1 through 11, teaches to the one guy who's the father of all the faithful. That is, the rest of the Old Testament goes out the window, and so does the New Testament. Adding to the covenant disannuls the covenant or annuls it. Verse 18, if the inheritance be of the law, it's no more of promise. But here is the fact, God gave it to Abraham by promise, simply by believing. And the word God gave it literally means, as literal as you can do it in English, God graced it by a promise. Here it is. Here's the promise. I give it to you. And you just receive it. You believe what God says and God makes it over to you through faith. And now to go a little bit further in these principles before we wind up. You don't suspend, you don't suspend the covenant with Abraham in the past by saying, well, God made a temporary alternative for the nation of Israel, think now Exodus onwards, in Old Testament days. So that from Abraham to the law, like Genesis 11 to 12 up to Genesis 50, from Abraham to the law, salvation, <coughs> promise, blessing, inheritance, that's by faith alone. But then from the law to Jesus Christ, 1,400 years or so, there it's faith and works whereby you inherit the land or the blessings or righteousness. Although we revert back to the Abrahamic covenant, when Jesus Christ comes, then it's by faith alone. No, no, no. The Abrahamic covenant is not and never will be annulled. It was by faith alone in Abraham's day and all of Genesis, all the way through the Old Testament and all the way to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And you don't say, ah, but this Abrahamic covenant 
with faith alone. That actually gives us now in the New Testament two ways of salvation. For Gentiles, it's faith alone and you get one aspect of the covenant with Abraham. But for Jews, Jews in the, after the coming of Christ, they can be saved by faith and works. No. Nor do you say, ah, in the future, in the future, the Jews are going to get the land of Canaan on the basis of an Abrahamic covenant. None of that. No, no dispensationalism. Very, very simple. Faith alone, the promise, the covenant, the inheritance, righteousness, and all the blessings in Jesus Christ. Faith alone in Abraham's day and throughout the book of Genesis. All of the Old Testament age and all of the New Testament age for Jew or Gentile. Anyone who trusts in Jesus Christ. Believe and you're an heir. You're an heir of heaven and you're an heir of the entire earth. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we pray that thou bless to us thy word by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Quicken us, Lord God, that we may believe and that we may inherit and that we may know ourselves and live consciously in the truth that we are heirs of thine and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing Psalm 105, verses 6 through 12. It speaks of this confirmed, ratified, firmly made covenant. It's being renewed, made sure, and it forever will endure, including its inheritance. This covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and through the ages 6 through 12 of Psalm 105. Yeah.
Now the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.